right. It is 2021. Praise the Lord. We made it. Um, and, uh, you know, and this is, I guess, every new year is celebrated in some similar ways. I think maybe there was a little bit, maybe a little bit more gusto in the excitement we saw. I've seen the people uh, about the turning of the page to 2021 from 2020. But, you know, really, we celebrate New Year's kind of the same way and have for a long time. And that is that we look at the new year and we see new opportunity. And a lot of people make resolutions. And those resolutions are, you know, to be, to be resolved. And let me just say that to make a resolution, it isn't an unbiblical thing. In fact, it's, it's very biblical to see throughout the scripture that people make resolutions that throughout the Old Testament, New, the New Testament, people resolve themselves to do certain things. What's important, I think, with it, when it comes to resolutions is that we resolve ourselves to do the right things. And so, and we, and we see a lot of that, right? People post things about new year, new you, right? And this is going to be the year that whatever, and talk about new places, that they want to go, new things that they want to do, new routines that they want to start. And a lot of those are healthy and a lot of them are good. Um, and I think one of the things that I find really interesting is that what we see in the scripture is that it isn't just, this isn't just a, a phenomenon that is reserved for the new year in scripture. What we see in, this, in the Bible is that we see that each day is a, is a new day. And that with each new day, God's mercies are new. And so we have, a sen in a sense, an ability to, and a, a calling on our lives to each day make a new opportunity. That each day is a, is a second chance. And so this morning I want to talk about second chances. And, and I think what we will see, I think that what we can see this year as we make resolutions, as we are resolved to improve our lives, at least when it comes to spirituality, to our walk, to our faith in Jesus Christ, that the way to get something new isn't to do something new, it's really to do something very old. If we really want to see new growth in our spiritual walk, we don't have to find some sort of new teaching or new teacher or new anything. The answer is, is very old. And we'll find it today in the book of Titus. So if you want to go ahead and turn in your copy of the Bible to the book of Titus, we're going to be looking at Titus chapter 2. And our, the teaching this morning is really centered around one important doctrine, and it is the doctrine of grace. And the doctrine of grace is vital, and it's not just vital for new believers, although sometimes the way that we talk about grace is we talk about it in the context only of salvation, that God's grace is extended to you in the, in the salvation, in the salvific work of Jesus Christ, and so that is how a lot of us certainly first experienced grace, and and sometimes I feel like we relegate grace only to that small window in the Christian walk, but that's not it. Grace is vital, not just for new believers, but to experienced believers. Notice how I didn't call anybody old right there. You didn't know I had my dancing shoes on. Yeah, um, not just new believers, but experienced believers. It's not just an experience, just not just for the, the lost to be found, but for the found to be redeemed every single day, for them to be sanctified, for us to be sanctified every single day. And so we're going to look at, at grace this morning, especially as we see it in Titus chapter 2. Now the first 10 verses of Titus chapter 2 are about sound doctrine. And he basically, Paul is telling Titus, this, this other minister of the gospel, he's telling him, these are the things that you should teach people to do, to be self-controlled, to be sober-minded, to be disciplined. And not only, not only do you teach people to, to conduct themselves in a particular way, in a Christian way, not only do you con teach people to conduct themselves as disciples of Jesus Christ, but as part of teaching people to be disciples of Jesus, you teach people to teach people to be disciples of Jesus, right? Because it's not just teach the men to do this and teach the women to do this, but it's teach the experienced men to teach the younger men. Teach the experienced women to teach the younger women. 
And see, what Paul has in mind here is us being connected, not just in couples and, and through marriage, but us being connected in a church to have the more experience teach the less experience so that young people can gain through your wisdom, through your knowledge, so that people can gain through your mistakes. Wouldn't that be amazing? Like, wouldn't it be great if you could look back at the ledger of your life and see all of those sort of red marks, all of those seasons where you were just messing up, those seasons where you were in sin, those seasons where you were far from the Lord, where you were making poor decisions, and, and you got into a relationship with a younger person, and you could see the handwriting on the wall for them, and you could see this guy is about to walk into the same trap that I walked into. This guy is about to waste potentially years of his life in the same way I did. Wouldn't it be amazing to be able to redeem those mistakes for someone else's encouragement, for someone else's benefit? And, and wouldn't that be just like God? Wouldn't that be just like God to take what our enemy meant for evil to destroy us and for him to use it to build someone else up? Let me say that again because y'all didn't say amen. Wouldn't that be just like God to, t I have to say it louder. Let me try one more time. Wouldn't that be just like our God to take your failures and my failures and use them for someone else's triumph? Amen. That's better. I'm missing, you know, that church of God that I preached at for Thanksgiving now. Anyway, um, that's him. That's what our God does. That's what he is about. He is about helping us, empowering us to encourage, to build up one another. And that's what we see at the beginning of Titus chapter 2. Now, in Titus chapter 2, verse 11, he switches gears a little bit. And instead of talking about the really practical aspects, he, he views things through a little bit more theological perspective. Saying, like, these are the things I want you to do, and here is the why I want you to do it. And he discusses that in those last few verses of Titus chapter 2. I'm going to start reading in verse 11. In Titus chapter 2, verse 11, he says, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Now, he starts there with the word for, which is to say this, these next few lines, these next few verses that he writes are connected to the ones that came before it, right? So all of these practical things that I'm teaching you to, to, to do, they are connected to the grace of God that has appeared. It is connected to the grace of God that has appeared. And the word that, it used, that he uses here for this appearance is epiphanes. And it, he only, this is only used in the New Testament. Besides the book of Titus, it's used one other time. Now, outside of the Bible, it was used to describe the appearance of the emperor being like that of a god. Right, like it was sort of a word that was reserved, right? Like you, you know, like if your wife came out of, out of the bathroom ready for a date and you really wanted to use Epiphanes, right? Like you are really appearing top notch tonight, right? That was the idea of this appearance. And so he uses this to describe the appearance of grace. It was used one other time in the New Testament in Luke chapter one, verse 79, where it describes the appearance of grace of Jesus Christ, where it describes his coming, and it says that his coming was a light to those who sit in darkness, and in the shadow of death, it is a way to move their feet onto the path of the righteous. Right? This is the appearing of God's grace, that it came through the person of Jesus Christ, and not just his birth, but his life, his death, his resurrection, and his exaltation, that that is how grace really became known in the world was through Christ Jesus. And in doing that, that God has brought salvation for all people, that he has brought salvation for all people. Now, I need to take just a second here to, to make something very clear. When it says bringing salvation for all people, this is not to say that 
that everyone is saved regardless of what they believe, that everyone's saved regardless of, what, of who they trust with their soul, that everyone's saved. It's not that. It's not an argument to say that because of what Jesus did, everybody's automatically saved and you don't even have to worship him. You don't even have to believe in him, right? That's, that's not what it's saying. This isn't a claim to universalism. It's, it's more like this. I had a friend uh, several years ago, I guess this was like 2007, and um, I had a friend, he, he said, listen, I've got the internet to my house, but I need a little help getting it set up. He was an older gentleman. And I said, you know, I'll, I'll come, I'll be there. I'll help you set this up. He, you know, he wanted to communicate with his grandkids who are in other parts of the country and, you know, had all these ideas about things he wanted to do because he knew the internet was a powerful thing. And so I got to his house and he said, all right, here's where they brought the internet in. And he said, he takes me to this coax line on the outside of the house. This is where they hooked it up. And I said, oh, okay, that's also your, your cable line okay, I'll trust you in that. And I said, okay, where does it go on the inside? And he says, the inside, it's over here. And he took me inside to, this, to the box. And he says, and this is the internet. And I said, all right. So now I've just got to hook this up to your computer. And he said, my what? I said, I've just got to hook your computer up to this box so you can get the internet on your computer. He said, I don't have a computer. I've got the internet. I said, well, Bill, you... You've got to have a computer to access the internet. He said, well, I talked to the company and they said that they were bringing the internet to right here. It took only a few more minutes and Bill got it. And we spent the afternoon going to Walmart and getting a computer and we then got him on the internet. See, saying that, that because Christ came that salvation is, has been taken to all people is like my friend having the internet in his house. Like it's, it was right there. He had ready access to it, but there was still something he had to do. There was still something that he had to do to be able to access the power of the internet. The gospel is here. The gospel is here. The goodness of God and his glory, his power, his mercy, his grace, it is imbued in this world through the life, death, resurrection, exaltation of Jesus. It is here, but there's still a step. But there's still this thing that people have to do. They have to be a part of that elect number. They have to give their life to Jesus Christ. And whether you call it being a Christian, being a disciple, a follower of the way, it, the, the language of that doesn't matter. But there is something that is on us to follow after Christ Jesus. So when he says that salvation has been brought for all, it is, it is there for the taking. It is there but people still have a certain responsibility when it comes to that salvation. Now, this is his first description of grace, of, of what grace has done, and that it, is, it has brought the opportunity of salvation for all people, which would, 40 years before Paul wrote this, would have, I mean, that would have gotten him stoned in Israel. The idea that God would take salvation out to all of the nations because for Israel they looked at the nations surrounding them the non-Jews surrounding them and they had picked out they would sometimes talk about a few righteous people of the nations a few righteous people of the nations in fact the nation state of Israel still does this they have a list of the righteous among the nations men like Schindler who saved all those people in the holocaust and they say well this is a righteous one from among the nations they don't recognize salvation as coming to the nations because they don't recognize the work of Jesus but Paul's pointing that very clearly he says listen Jesus has done this the grace of God has been brought to us for salvation for all people but it Grace doesn't stop there. That isn't the end of it. I think sometimes we have this view of grace that that is its power to bring salvation, but that isn't it. He goes on in verse 12. It goes on, and that's important that it goes on because this is what else grace does. Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. This is it. It not only brings us salvation, but it then trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Grace informs our no's and our yeses. That because of the grace of God made known to us in Christ Jesus, 
we have the ability to have the right no and the right yes. We can say no to ungodliness. We can say no to worldly passions. And instead, we can say yes to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. He tells us our no, and it tells us our yeses. And this is so important for us. It's so important for us that as we grow in our faith, we grow in our faith, we let grace do its work in us. You and I, we know people. We know people who have walked an aisle at a church. They have made a decision. They filled out the card. They prayed a prayer, and they got plunged into the waters of baptism. And then within maybe a week, maybe a month, they're gone. They were gone. I remember in, early in my ministry, I baptized a, a young man, and I baptized him, and the next week I called him to go to lunch, and he, he didn't answer. I sent him a text. Hey, I'd like to get coffee with you sometimes, talk about you know, kind of how you see yourself serving in the church and connecting and that sort of thing. No answer. And for weeks, I tried to get in touch with this young man because I didn't want him to become disconnected from the church. And when I finally ran into him at a Chili's in Texarkana, Texas, I said, hey man, <laughs> where, where have you been? I've been trying to get a hold of you. He says, well, I, I did the thing. Like I, I did it, I'm saved, so I'm good. And I realized that we had not done a good job of explaining grace to him. Grace isn't just for salvation, it's for the training. It's to inform our no's and our yeses. This is what it, it is to be, to be self-controlled. I think sometimes people get the wrong idea of what God really wants from us. He, that, yeah, we get the wrong idea. Let me, I'm going to get to that in the next couple of verses. So we, it informs our no's and our yeses. It gives us salvation. But the third thing that grace does is it, in verse 13, says that because of grace, we are waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. It gives us something to wait for. Grace gives us this blessed hope, this appearing of glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, when I said it's 2021, 2020's gone, I guess all of us have, in a sense, have been looking forward to a year that's involved so much turmoil and so much difficulty being passed. But the reality is that when we turn the page, 2021 didn't hold this great new hope. It wasn't as if turning the page solved all of the problems. We're still wearing masks. We're still keeping our distance. The things that were problems in our country last week and the week before are still problems in our country. Right? There's, still, there's still issues that we have to face. 2021 was not our great hope. A lot of people put a lot of stock, have put a lot of stock in 2021 as being the time for a turnaround, and I pray that it is, but that turnaround isn't going to come from a calendar. It's going to come from Jesus Christ. It's going to come from the appearance of grace to us. That is our hope. Our hope is in this, our blessed hope is in the appearing of the glory of our great God, Jesus Christ. Like this, this is our hope. And by grace, we have that hope. Apart from God's grace, we don't have that hope. Apart from God's grace, there is no hope in Jesus Christ. If because God's grace was given to us freely. There was nothing we could do to earn it. There was nothing we could do to, to gain God's favor. But because of his grace, Jesus Christ came to die for our sins. Because of his grace, we can be redeemed from that. And it's only through that grace that we have hope. And, and then in verse 14, Paul gives us a picture of why God would choose to do this sort of thing. Because of his grace, because of this characteristic of him, because of his character of being gracious, because of who God is, Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. 
who are zealous for good works. See, Jesus did this. He gave himself for us so that we could be his people. So that we could be his people and so that our behavior, so that our hearts, our minds, our lives matched up with him. So that we would be transformed into his likeness. So that Jesus Christ would be the first among of many who follow after him. So this is why he did this. This is why he is. This is what his goal was in coming, was to have a people of his own. The Old Testament points to that through the law that God tried to make Israel a peculiar people, separate and distinct, holy from the other people that were in Palestine. And they, they couldn't. They couldn't become a, a distinct people. They constantly gave themselves away, gave themselves over to the idolatry and sin of their neighbors. But in Christ Jesus, we can be distinct. In Christ Jesus, we can be holy. We can be his people. And part of that, part of being his people comes through in, in the way we act. Comes through in our yeses and nos. The things that we say yes to and say no to. It comes through in our, our self-control. Sometimes I think that we get this idea um, and maybe Christians don't get it as much as people outside of, of Christianity do. I know I have one friend uh, on Facebook who's constantly you know, throwing shots at me that I, I'm doing something or I'm acting a certain way or I'm voting a certain way or believing a certain thing because that's what Christians are supposed to do. And, and I'm like, that's, that's, that's not, I'm not some aut- automaton. I'm not a robot. I'm not some sort of mindless zombie. I have, I'm a person that has control of myself. I make choices based on the conviction that, that God has made in my heart. I want to, to look like him. I want to be like him. In the same way, we, we want to be like our parents. We look at our parents' behavior and we say, man, you know, the, there are some these really good things about my mom or my dad, and I really want to emulate those things and there are some not so great things about them, and hopefully I can leave those behind. And then when we're, you know, years later, we're having a, a discussion with our spouse, and they say, you're acting just like your... And we say, oh, no, you didn't. Um, we do that. But, and, then, and then we hope that our children will do the same, that they will take what is best in us, and that they'll leave behind the things that we're not so happy with ourselves about. This week... I made my son a cup of coffee. And yes, I know he is nine years old. And yes, that is probably too early to start drinking coffee. But it's been a long year. And I can only say no to so many things. And he got me. He got me. And I was like, fine. You can have some coffee. And so I poured him a little coffee out of my glass. And he put in a lot of creamer. And a little more. And then he drank it. He was delighted. He was so happy. And I was just like, please, just keep it down until I finish this, please. Um, And when it was done, he walked off and he started to go play or whatever. And, And I looked there and there was my glass and his glass. And I picked up both glasses and I took them to the sink and I washed them out and then I put them in the dishwasher yesterday he had us for a cup of coffee and, and I gave in again and so I made him a cup of coffee and I made my coffee and Haley's coffee and, and we all are drinking our coffee mine's the biggest glass and then you know it's like the three bears kind of thing and, and he finished his coffee and he drank it through a straw and he threw the straw in the trash and then he went to the sink and he washed it out and then he put it in the dishwasher. And a single tear started right here. And it just went down my cheek. And I said, who are you? No, I said, I am so proud of you. And he's like, what did I do? <laughs> you put a dish in the dishwasher without me having to tell you to. He did not do what I told him to do. 
He did what I wanted him to do. If we're going to be a people of Jesus Christ's own, it isn't just that we do the thing that he is telling us to do, but we have a heart after his heart that we do the things that he wants us to do because we want to do them. Not because we begrudgingly say, oh, okay, I'm going to say no to this and I'm going to say yes to this because you're making me. But I'm going to say no to this because I don't want to do that. I'm going to say yes to this good thing because it's truly the desire of my heart. Our goal is not just to be a robot that does everything Jesus says. It is to be transformed into his likeness. And only grace can do that. It is only by grace that we can be transformed that way. Now, before we close, I want to take one minute to talk about the means of grace. Theologians have talked about the means of grace for hundreds of years and that is, how is it, how is it that, that we receive, know, and grow in grace? What are the words and actions that we can take that are ordained by God as channels by which he might convey grace to us? How can he translate his grace so that we can understand it? And there are really three ways that we should understand his grace. One is that it is a preventative grace that because of his grace, there are many traps, many trials that because of his grace, we miss out on completely. That we just warp right past those things because his grace prevents us from having to suffer that way. There is another element to his grace that is the justifying grace. That his grace makes us right with God. That it, when God looks at me, he doesn't see my sin anymore, but he sees Jesus' righteousness that he sees Christ's righteousness applied to me and that when he looked at Jesus on the cross, that he didn't see his son for just a little while, that he didn't see just his son, that he saw my sin resting on his son and his wrath for my sin was poured out on his son and because of that, his righteousness is applied to me. That's the justifying nature of his grace. But then there's also the sanctifying nature of his grace and this is that thing that makes us holy it's the grace that separates us from the world so that we can be in the world, but not of it. It's the part of grace that makes us choose the right no's and the right yeses that transforms our heart to his heart. And that sort of grace, that sanctifying grace, we see come to us in a few means. One is prayer. And I don't know what your daily routine is, but I would say before your feet hit the floor, let your thoughts drift heavenward. Before you begin your day, start with prayer and conduct yourself all day long in an attitude of prayer. Let our every word, our every thought, be, let us recognize that God is there, that he is present, that he is watching, and let it all be a prayer to him. So we understand his grace through prayer and the way that he moves our thoughts, the way that he directs our thinkings and our thinkings, our attitudes and our attitudes into actions. We also see that a, a means of grace is the scripture. Tomorrow morning, we're going to start our new F260 plan. We're going to be reading through the New Testament this year and much greater detail than we did last year. But every morning, Monday through Friday, there is a plan. You can go to nobcfamily.com and look at the F260 reading plan. It'll bring up the scriptures. You click a couple of links. It gets you to a place where you can read it. You can even chew, click a link and the computer will read it to you. Like if you have a smartphone, it will, you can just put it on in the car and it will read the scriptures to you. If you really want to put the scriptures into your mind, Read it while it's being read to you. And then for the rest of the day, your thoughts are going to go back to the scripture. Everything, every encounter you have, every opportunity you take or miss will be in the light of what you read in scripture that morning. And God's grace will be extended to us through the scriptures. And lastly, the thing that we've seen theologians say that is a means of grace again and again is communion specifically the time when we gather together and take the lord's supper 
when we celebrate his life, death, and resurrection through eating bread and drinking wine, to say this is his body broken for us, this is his blood poured out for us. But our communion isn't limited to that. Because when Jesus spoke to the disciples, he said, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. He didn't mean once every other month, right? He wasn't, he didn't have in mind that we would do that once every other month, once every, every month, or even once a week. But it was as often as you eat and drink, do this in remembrance of me. That as, as we're eating and, and drinking, whether it's here with that little bitty cellophane sealed piece of, I'm not really sure that that was bread. If you were here for the candlelight service, you know what I'm talking about. It was truly horrible. Um, but it was clean. There was no COVID on it. Um, but it's not just that. I mean, it certainly is that, that we celebrate his presence in our lives. We celebrate his presence in our community. We celebrate our unity, our connection through the breaking of bread there. But we celebrate our connection through the breaking of bread every time we break bread. That when we sit down with our families to eat, that we ought to celebrate his presence in our life then. As we gather with, with friends and, and sit down for a meal together, we celebrate his presence with that community when we join with our, our life groups, Sunday school classes, small groups, and we break donuts together in coffee, that that is a time, that is an opportunity to understand, to receive his grace. And we receive it, we receive it through community with each other. There are many expressions in English that convey this same idea, but one of them is, if you run with dogs, you'll get fleas yeah. the old testament says that as iron sharpens iron so one man or person sharpens another that basically that the character of the people we connect with will will filter across to us that some form of social osmosis take place takes place and and it as our friends do so we do and so what we want to do here is we want to be connected through small groups, through life groups. We want to be connected. We want to put believers in a position to where they can be connected to each other so that as you and I get older, we also get mature in the faith. So that as I live my life, that you're there as an observer of my life to say, good job. You're there to see me take the spiritual cup, wash it out, and put it in the spiritual dishwasher of life and say, I'm proud of you. And you're there to, to look and say, hey, man, you, you missed it. But I know you're going to do better next time. It's through that communion, through that, com through that union that we have in Christ Jesus that his grace is made known to us in a way that changes us into his likeness progressively more every day. So my encouragement to you this year is that you would begin this year, tomorrow morning, that you would seek the Lord in prayer at the beginning of your day and all day long. That you would take some time each day to dedicate your thoughts to the scripture, to read it, have it read to you. That you take your, some time to dedicate your thoughts to his written, expressed word so that it can direct your thinking, your attitude, and your actions for the day. And that you would, that you would seek out community. That you would seek out community to find a place and a, a people with whom you can be connected so that together you can grow in the Lord. These are the means of his grace. And I, I have seen, I've seen what this can do. You've seen what this can do. I was talking to a group of people this week and say, you, you hardly ever see a spiritually mature person who is alone. But what we instead see is 
spiritually mature people in groups, a group of friends who have walked side by side, who've encouraged each other, who've helped each other to grow, who've been there for the, as you said it this morning, who've been there for the birth of babies and the loss of babies, who've been there for all the milestones and who have held one another accountable moving forward together. It is what every Christian needs. And it is what our church, it's one of the main reasons that our church exists, is to give you a place to come together to make those connections. And so we're going to make those connections. Um, next, in fact, starting next week, our adult two, three, and four classes are going to be meeting in that room right there. And we're going to have a little breakfast together. We're going to break up into small groups. Some of the groups will be for couples, married couples. Some will just be for men. Some will just be for women. And, and we will begin to sort of connect to each other around the Scripture. Our hope being that in those small group connections that you will find the intimacy, the love, the encouragement and accountability that will extend God's grace to you for years to come through the study of his word in a group together. I think maybe the last verse of Titus chapter 2, verse 15, will give us a, a good point for closing. And in verse 15, he says, Paul says, Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with authority. Let no one disregard you. He says, declare these things, to state these things, to make these things our express purpose that we are going to let God's grace transform us. That should be a declaration that we make, not just with our words, but with our actions. That as people observe our lives, they see that we are being transformed into his likeness. It should be that we declare these things, that we are going to exhort one another, that we are going to rebuke one another, that we're going to make sure that, that we are walking the walk, not just talking the talk. And then his last line, let no one disregard you. Because that's what's happening a lot in the world today. We see that a lot of, in a lot of places, in a lot of areas of life, that Christians are being disregarded. The Christians are being disregarded, that our opinions, that our thoughts, that our ideas are, are being disregarded. Is it because the truth of Scripture has somehow changed? No. Is it because God's power is somehow waning in these days? No. It's because we have not let grace transform our lives. It's because we do a great job of preaching, of talking the talk, and we don't do as good a job of walking the walk. And when the world sees that, they don't see people who are struggling. They don't see people who are just trying to make it through. They look and they see hypocrisy. And when they see that, they disregard us. But that doesn't have to be our story. If we were left to our own devices, it would be our story. Left on our own, apart from the grace of God, we would not be able to do what he has required of us. But by God's grace, we can. Because of the transforming power of his grace, we are saved. We are sanctified. We are made holy. And we will have power in this community to make an impact for his kingdom. Let's pray together. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Lord, we thank you for the second chance that comes with each new day. Lord, I pray that if there is any here that doesn't know you, that doesn't know the redeeming power of the cross, that today might be the day of salvation for them. I pray that your spirit would move in hearts today, that if there's any here who hasn't made a decision to declare that they are a follower of Jesus Christ, that today might be the day for them. Lord, I'd love nothing more than to figure out how to do a baptism in a gym. So if there's any here that needs to make that decision, I pray that you'd move in their hearts today. Lord, if there are those here today that maybe they're walking through life and they feel as if they are alone, and maybe they've gone comfortable with being alone. 
But Lord, your word tells us that, that you've made us for community, that you've made us to be connected to people. Lord, I pray that if this is the place for them, that you would open their hearts to that, that they would seek out connection as we are seeking out connection with them. Lord, I pray that next week as we inaugurate a, a new way of, of doing life groups and a couple of classes that we would see that we'd see change, that we'd see growth, that we'd see your spirit poured out powerfully, that we would experience your grace in significant ways. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have a, a brief time of invitation as the band plays. If you will, stand with us as we sing.